Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's semi-final debate. My name is James Long, and I am the chairman of this debate. <coughs> the timekeeper is Jack Fewenfield. The debate will be judged by a panel of three adjudicators, who are Miss L Miss Lowen, Mr. Hazel, and Miss Hale. The topic of tonight's debate is that pepper spray in South Australia should no longer be a prohibited substance. The affirmative team, seated to my right, is from Pembroke School. The negative team, seated to my left, is Pompey Grammar School. The speaking time is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile <coughs> phones are switched off. I declare this debate open, and I call upon the first permanent speaker. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for this evening is that pepper spray in South Australia should no longer be a prohibited substance. We, the affirmative team, strongly agree with this statement. We define the topic as that pepper spray, an aerosol spray containing olorescent capsicum oils used only in disarming and defensive weapon in the state of South Australia, should no longer be prohibited, forbidden or a banned substance and should be a common item available to the public. However, we as the affirmative team propose a model that the pepper spray be legalised but only available for purchase with an ID by a person over the age of 18. We also propose that any purchaser or user of pepper spray have a licence. However, pepper spray can be used under the age of adulthood with permission from a legal guardian. As well as this, people with access to pepper spray have to have un undergone a brief training on how to use it safely in order to receive their licence. We also propose that these licences would not be given to anyone with a criminal record and would be taken away on the gaining of a criminal record or misuse of the spray on a case-by-case -case basis. The spray must be marked with a self-defence only label and is to contain a maximum of 5% OC as an active ingredient. This is because according to sabreed.com, pepper spray becomes hotter with greater OC and we believe 5% is generous and still incredibly effective as a self-defensive weapon. Our model this evening serves to limit this debate to what we believe is most likely set of circumstances to which the spray was no longer be prohibited in South Australia. Our model reflects the existing laws in Western Australia where pepper spray is not prohibited but is in fact a controlled weapon. This evening I will be talking about how pepper spray would provide a means of self-defence not currently available to the public and how we have a right to defend ourselves in any situation. I will look at the different uses of pepper spray and I will show you how the world is becoming less safe and a defensive item is needed. My second speaker, Zaza, will be looking at how the use of pepper spray would stop long-term trauma from what the attack could have been and how criminals get their hands on more dangerous weapons so the public needs a means of self-defence. Now to my first point this evening. The most obvious reason why pepper spray shouldn't be prohibited is that it's a great means of self-defence. Ladies and gentlemen, according to highconsumption.com, the most popular and most effective form of self-defense is in fact pepper spray. Following these are stun guns, baseball bats and batons to list a few more. However, all four of these items are in fact illegal to carry in South Australia. According to youthlord.asn.au, it's illegal to carry an imitation firearm and it's also illegal to carry an object such as a baseball bat in public if its intended use is to cause harm. These sources all come to the conclusion that there is currently no way to defend yourself in South Australia other than physical fighting or rather hand-to-hand -hand combat. Realistically, ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that not everyone will have the means or ability to learn how to defend themselves without the use of a weapon. Additionally, I stress to you, ladies and gentlemen, that everyone needs an item of self-defence that is freely available to them. Even if pepper spray is not the best way to implement a personal defence system, as I stated before, it's the most effective and easiest to use. Whether it's best, it's the best way or not, every single person deserves a right to bear a defensive weapon while in public. This point is even more significant when taking into account the significant risk of, of assault that many members of the public face, notably young women travelling alone. Ladies and gentlemen, pepper sprays are prohibited in order to prevent its use as a weapon in assault by criminals. However, pepper spray would not be that effective of a weapon to attack someone with. In fact, pepper spray was invented to be purely a defensive weapon. It was created in 1965 by Alan Lee Lippman after his wife was threatened on the street. It is designed to be easily used by someone with little to no skill combat, purely as a weapon to render an attacker unable to cause harm for a relatively short period of time. Additionally, pepper spray is not a low-cost substance. According to Sunday Morning Herald's article written by Claudia Fleurs, it can cost up to $3,000 for a single tube. I'm not sure about you, ladies and gentlemen, 
But if I was a criminal with the intent to cause harm, I would not spend $3,000 on a purely defensive weapon that isn't even designed to cause serious harm. Pepper spray as an emergency weapon is high cost and is certainly not for play. To elaborate further on the uses of pepper spray, many sources such as sydneycriminallawyers.com written by Ugo Nedim shows that pepper spray is also incredibly effective against animals such as dogs, bears or any other animal with means to attack you. This evening I would like to finish with perhaps one of the most important factors to take into consideration during tonight's debate. Attacks in SA are rising, and with no means of self-defence will probably not decrease any time soon. The number of sexual assaults reported in South Australia have risen by more than 20% in the past 10 years, as according to SA Police statistics. As well as this, the latest statistics show that SA has the highest rate of stalking in the nation with more than 3% of its population targeted in a year, compared to the average below 2.5%. The extent of domestic violence, stalking, sexual harassment and violence in Australia has re been revealed in the most extensive survey of its kind. The Australian Bureau of Statistics show that most Australian women and one in four Australian men have been sexually harassed in their lifetime. And with all this information, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you why forms of self-defence are prohibited. We all need a form of self-defence. <coughs> the Western Australia Police at police.wa.gov.au show that in 2015 their number of offences was around 293,000 and has dropped to a current average of around, of around 250,000. To compare, South Australian Police website shows that our offences are on a steady rise from about 205,000 in 2015 now at around 267,000 offences. The question we, as a state, need to ask ourselves is how we can better prevent assault, especially the sexual assault of women and vulnerable citizens in the sense of security. The clear answer to this question is to provide those vulnerable with an attack with the means to defend themselves. When it, when it ultimately comes down to it, in the event of assault, it is unlikely that the only people present are going to be the victim and the attacker. To not cause the victim a method of self-defense is to condemn them to their fate and hugely reduce their chances of escaping harm. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, South Australia currently has a limited means of self-defence and we have the right to a defensive item that is effective and readily available. Thank you. I call upon the first negative speaker, James Lance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman. As you know, tonight's debate is on the notion that pepper spray in South Australia should no longer be a prohibited substance. As the negative team, we disagree with this statement and believe that pepper spray should remain prohibited. Tonight, I, the first speaker, will be telling you about the dangers of pepper spray and the safety issues it can cause. Our second speaker will tell you about how unreliable pepper spray can be and present some far better alternatives. The third speaker will rebut the team, team opposite's points and summarize our case. Now, we agree with most of the model put forward by the opposing team, but we suggest that we use an existing US one which does not require any training to use um, pepper spray. We would also like to highlight that a prohibited substance is a legally dangerous article, which means it is illegal to be carried unless you have an exemption by the law. But before I begin my case, I'd like to point out a few flaws in the opposition's case. The opposition said that pepper spray is a good weapon of self-defense. This isn't true because people rarely carry pepper spray in their hands at all times. It will most often be in a bag or a pocket or a purse. And precious seconds would be wasted trying to 
get that pepper spray out from wherever it was being held while being attacked. It's, it's rare that people know when they are going to be assaulted. They also said that pepper spray cannot effectively be used as an offensive weapon. It can. I will, I will touch on this later, and criminals can use pepper spray to hurt a victim far easier than a victim can use to defend themselves. And now on to my first point. Simply put, pepper spray is dangerous. There is a reason it was prohibited in the first place. I'd like to point out to you the eerie similarities that this topic has to the wider debate around gun laws. The main reason that pepper spray is legal to carry in some areas, namely Western Australia, is as a means of self-defense. This is a reason often cited for why firearms should be legal to carry. But it's missing the point. In order to reduce attacks and general violence, the answer is not more weapons. That is simply counterproductive. Introducing more weapons into the population merely raises the chance of attacks occurring. Allowing more people to carry pepper spray provides access for not only people who feel they need it for self-defense, but also for people who could use it to attack others unprovoked, increasing the chance for it to be used aggressively against others. According to a study by the California Sheriff Department, pepper spray is incredibly ineffective when used as a defensive weapon, as the second speaker will explain further. However, when an assailant uses pepper spray with no warning, it can be very effective and can quickly disable a victim and give them no chance to defend themselves. And criminals, the people who would be using this spray to assault others, often know how best to catch a victim unawares. They attack without warning, giving their victim no chance to respond, so, so a victim would not be able to get pepper spray of their own in time. Be beginning a confrontation with a stream of pepper spray to the face would give their victim no chance to react and would likely put them into shock quickly. Again, as the second speaker will later explain, pepper spray is, a, is far less likely to be effective as a defensive weapon, which is why removing pepper spray's status as a prohibited substance is even suggested in the first place. But to attack viciously and without warning, it can cause lasting harm. According to the Journal of Environmental and Analytical Chemistry, or the GAEAC, police suggest to people who have been sprayed with pepper spray to breathe normally. People frequently go into shock as a response to being exposed to pepper spray, as opposed to displaying actual symptoms. Proponents of the use of pepper spray frequently refer to this as a reason to allow it to be carried, as exposure has long, no long-lasting negative effects when used correctly. However, again, according to the JEAC, the use of pepper spray in recent situations of civil unrest demonstrates that exposure to this weapon is difficult to control, and it is often just not used correctly. Do we really want to allow just <coughs> anyone to use these weapons without any training? They could cause lasting damage, not only to other people, but to themselves as well, if used the spray incorrectly. So, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, pepper spray should remain a prohibited substance. Legalizing it creates a slippery slope that could easily lead to guns being legalized in much the same way to keep people safe. It would also prove a useful weapon to those who it would be legalized to stop. Thank you. I call upon the second affirmative speaker, Zaza Za Simmons. Good evening, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin my speech tonight, I would like to rebut the flaws in the opposition's case. First of all, um, as the affirmative team, we would like to uphold our model as we believe that training is very important in safening the use of pepper spray. And if the negative team really believes in their own points about the safety, they would agree with us. We also think that training would increase the effectiveness of pepper spray. The first speaker on the negative team has also stated 
that we should have less weapons, not more. However, in Australia, we barely already do. We pretty much ban guns, knives, and at the moment, pepper spray. And yet, rape and sexual assault, uh, rape and physical assault still happen. Therefore, I don't think that's where the problem lies. Tonight, as second speaker, I will be talking to you about the difference in the physical pain one receives from pepper spray versus the not only physical pain of rape and assault, but also the long-term mental effects one has from it. I will also be talking about the strict and nonsensical pepper spray laws in place in Australia now. For my first point, I will be discussing, discussing the predominantly temporary effects of predominantly temporary pain of pepper spray versus the potentially serious long-term physical and mental effects of being assaulted. The effects of pepper spray, whilst it causes severe discomfort, are minimal compared to someone who has suffered sexual or physical assault. As stated by the School of Medicine and from the University Institute of Illinois Chicago, the most common physical effects someone will experience from pepper spray is a bubbling or boiling sensation followed by a temporary blindness and eye pain for around 30 to 45 minutes. It can also burn the throat, causing wheezing, dry coughing, and or the inability to speak or breathe for a limited time. In rare cases, it, it can cause a lack of blood flow and oxygen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're not saying that's not bad. And we do not think to trivialise the experience of pepper spray victims, but it can be easily treated and it can be a lot worse. When someone is assaulted or raped, for instance, they not only suffer physical consequences, but also severe long-term trauma effects. Like with pepper spray, there are numerous short-term physical effects that can come from an attack. According to HealthyPlace.com, the effects of for sexual assault are bruising and bleeding on the body, urinary infections, pregnancy, and STDs. And those of regular physical abuse can include cuts, bruises, broken bones, and other physical maladies. However, there are also numerous long-term effects that can come from being assaulted, which do not exist in relation to pepper spray. For someone who is raped, these long-term effects are predominantly mental. This includes PTSD, depression, borderline personality disorder, sleeping, eating, and or dissociative identity disorders, and suicidal tendencies, among others. Long-term effects of physical assault can be arthritis, hypertension, heart disease, and chronic pain symptoms, as well as the psychological effects stated before. Ladies and gentlemen, whilst the pain one would encounter from pepper spray would no doubt be uncomfortable, it is temporary and short-lived. A sexual assault victim would not only endure short-term physical illnesses, I mean issues, but they would also have to endure long-term physical and mental ones. When comparing the two, I'm sure that you would all agree with me in saying that the after-effects of rape and, sex and assault are far worse than those of pepper spray, and that is why it should no longer be prohibited. Now to my next point, how the laws <coughs> against pepper spray are unnecessarily strict and do not make sense for innocent people who are at the bottom of their backs, either for very strict emergencies or in some cases forgotten. A woman by the name of Claudia Fleurs wrote about how she was nearly convicted for carrying pepper spray and a Swiss army knife in the bottom of her bag. She was attending a court case as a journalist and had been running late. She then arrived at the conveyor belt and was picked up for unknowingly carrying a 10 milligram pepper spray bottle and a Swiss army knife from her trip to Western Australia. However, it was not the Swiss army knife that would cause her the most trouble, but the pepper spray. She had initially purchased a spray for use against wild animals that she was scared to be facing in the mining belt of WA and had decided to keep the small bottle as a woman in an unpredictable community. However, this honest mistake for simply wishing to defend herself nearly cost her 14 years in prison. Luckily for Fleurs, the magistrate was sensitive to her predicament and believed it to be a case of over-vigilant policing and left her free of charges. This, however, did not take away the months of waiting and stress that Fleurs wrote about, and the penalty of 14 years imprisonment is very real and very extreme, especially compared to the maximum penalty of two years that one would have to face for carrying a knife. Despite Ms. Fleurs' reputable position and remorseful outlook, she still faced a sentence greater than the average rape sentence, as I will soon elaborate on. The laws against pepper spray are also problematic as someone who you could use pepper spray to defend themselves against a rapist and then the person committing the rape crime could easily get away while the victim suffers a trial for possession and use of pepper spray. According to the sentencing statistics for the Victorian Supreme and County Court, only 11% of rapists 
were convicted and the average sentence they faced was five to seven years. For someone to commit the crime and to serve six years only if they're prosecuted seems unfair compared to prosecuting someone for having a small can of pepper spray to defend themselves. This, this simply supports my point that having pepper spray as a prohibited substance in South Australia is far too harsh, especially compared to the punishments for crimes of a much more grievous nature. To conclude, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, pepper spray should no longer be a prohibited substance in South Australia. It is certainly the better option compared to the dangers of assault and rape and the consequences one would have to face if they were carrying pepper spray now no matter the reason or if they were even going to be used, are far too extreme for this defensive tool. Thank you. I call upon the second negative speaker, James Burgess. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mr Chairman. As you already know, the topic for tonight's debate is that pepper spray in South Australia should no longer be a prohibited substance. We, the negative team, would like to reaffirm that it should remain a prohibited substance. Our first speaker brought up the issues with safety and security, and I will be explaining the failings of pepper spray as a solution to assault and other better means of being safe. But first, I must address some of the flaws in the opposition's argument. Their first speaker said that pepper spray is incredibly expensive, costing around $3,000. He tried to use this to say that uh, criminals would not go to such lengths to use a purely defensive weapon. Um, but he also said that um, everyone has the right to a defensive weapon. $3,000 is a lot of money. There are a lot of people who can't afford to spend that money on something that they might not use ever. Um, or if they do, very rarely. Um, he also said we have a right to a defensive weapon. However, he cited no source for this, and nor did he provide a strong argument for this to be true. He also said that there is no way to defend yourself without a, we without a weapon. Uh, martial arts are highly effective in not just defending yourself, but also in dealing with dangerous situations. A person can easily, on top of this, a person can also easily be disarmed and their weapon used against them if they are attacked, um, if the attacker has the advantage of surprise. And yeah, and the, the attacker can see what the uh, victim is holding in their hands when they go to make an attack. The, an attacker can uh, use a blitz strategy where they hold a person's hand when they're holding a canister of pepper spray, for example, and hit them with the other hand so, so as to disorient them and prevent them from retaliating. Their second speaker spoke about the severity of punishments, bringing up the example of the lawyer who carelessly brought pepper spray into a court. Um, she spoke at great length about the harsh punishments for bringing pepper spray into South Australia. We would like to affirm, reaffirm that this is not relevant to the topic. This topic is about whether or not uh, pepper spray should no longer be prohibited, not about the severity of punishment for it, for carrying it in South Australia. Now to my arguments. Whilst pepper spray is meant to protect people from being assaulted, it has many drawbacks. A case study by the California Sheriff's Department simulated 48 assaults on eight trained women. These women were all carrying pepper spray in their hand with the safety off whilst leaving a supermarket. These women were then assaulted by a single deputy who tried to grab her purse or push her to the ground. The assailants were hit by the pepper spray less than 20% of the time and only a few times to the face. The few times the officers were hit in the face, it didn't stop them. 
uh, they only felt the effects a minute later, a minute or so later. This test was set up with the women knowing that they were going to use the pepper spray and having it ready to use. In reality, pepper spray would probably be in a purse and would take precious seconds to find, as well as more time to deactivate the safety, let alone aim and fire. The canister's pepper spray are kept, is kept in, are liable to failure due to the elements, <coughs> and are known to lose effectiveness over time. A woman with pepper spray is more likely to feel safe and become over-reliant on pepper spray to save them. In the mid-90s, a police officer, who had been told that pepper spray would work on everyone, was killed. A violent criminal who had just walked out of his house after beating his wife confronted the officer who was walking up to his house. The officer sprayed the criminal with his canister, with his canister of pepper spray numerous times. The criminal was unaffected by it, however, and used the officer's distraction as an opportunity to beat him to death. The officer died with a pepper spray canister still in his hand. If this can happen to a highly trained officer, then it can and likely will happen to other people using pepper spray. Pepper spray is an object which is useless to you if not on your person. Learning a martial art not only teaches you how to use your hands, knees and feet to protect yourself, uh, it also gives you training in dealing with dangerous situations. The majority of assaults are committed within a woman's home where she is unlikely to be carrying her pepper spray. Being trained in martial arts allows you to always be ready to protect yourself, not just on the street. Pepper spray is also not guaranteed to work on everyone, with many cans specifying that it is unlikely to work on enraged, intoxicated or drugged persons. A martial art is much more reliable as a means of protecting yourself and is perfectly legal. In conclusion, whilst pepper spray is advertised as being a great defence against an assailant, these cans are highly liable to failure and are not as effective as people are led to believe. On top of this, they are almost never kept ready to hand when they are needed, as people rarely expect the attack. It is far more effective to learn a martial art or other means of protecting oneself in a dangerous situation as this gives realistic expectations and techniques for staying safe. There is no point in pepper spray being allowed if it doesn't always do the job it's meant to do. Thank you. called on the third affirmative speaker, Kate Crowley. Good evening, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, the topic for tonight's semi-final debate is that pepper spray should no longer be a prohibited substance in South Australia. Before I summarise the strong arguments already made by my team, I'd like to address and rebut the key points raised by the negative team. The opposition seems to be making many of their arguments around the ineffectiveness of pepper spray. There's no doubt that there can be issues with using pepper spray without appropriate training, and for that reason we suggested that training in its use and other self-defense strategies be required prior to purchase. This would have the added benefit of teaching potential victims the benefits of situational awareness and other means that might enable them to ward off an attacker. OC is generally very effective if used appropriately, as it has both lacrimatory and inflammatory effects. When deployed correctly, it causes the attacker's eyes and nose to run and also causes swelling of the eyes, resulting in temporary blindness or visual impairment. It's this feature of pepper spray that may give a victim a few seconds to escape an attack. It's not 100% effective against all individuals, but given the long-term harm of being assaulted, as my second speaker elaborated on, we believe it's nonetheless worth making it available to vulnerable groups. The opposition, specifically the first speaker, cited various data to support their argument that pepper spray can cause permanent harm. According to an article published by the US Department of Justice in March 1994, the FBI's Firearms Training Unit conducted extensive research prior to the introduction of OC-based sprays for its special agents. 
This included testing by chemists in the FBI and information provided by the U.S. Army Chemical Research and Development Center. FBI chemists did not foresee any long-term health risks associated with the use of OC. Likewise, police agencies responding to a questionnaire from the FTU didn't report any medical problems with OC base sprays, although an occupational health consultant questioned by the FBI did note, it, did note the theoretical risk of using OC on persons with pre-existing respiratory conditions such as asthma. Subsequent research into 63 deaths which involved the use of OC by law enforcement in the US failed to find direct causal links between the use of OC and death, except in two cases where the suspect also suffered from asthma. Both of these cases also involved the subject being restrained. Accordingly, it's quite possible that death resulted from a combination of OC, asthma, and positional asphyxia. The conclusion of the most comprehensive study for the US Department of Justice in 2004 stated that there's no evidence that OC as used by law enforcement officers in confrontational situations is a total or contributing cause of death, except when pre-existing asthma is present. Our opposition, once again primarily their first speaker, suggested that criminals might seek to acquire pepper spray for use in crime if it's made available. Research published by the Australian Institute of Criminology in 2008 cites data from New South Wales and international jurisdictions, including the UK, which make it clear that handguns are the weapon of choice for criminals. Despite strict restrictions on firearm ownership after Port Arthur, levels, levels of illegal hand, handgun ownership are high. According to data from the Australian Institute of Criminology, around 5% of detainees held by police in watch houses admit to having owned a legal handgun in the previous 12 months. Criminals are perfectly capable of acquiring handguns and other lethal weapons on the black market. Whilst they may also choose to acquire pepper spray, we believe this does not pose a significant additional risk to public safety. After all, a robbery, robbery using pepper spray has far less potential to turn deadly than a similar robbery with a gun or a knife. Their first speaker argued that the solution to assault is not more weapons. Their second speaker also went on to offer an alternative as martial arts. It's true that some proponents of legalizing pepper spray have called for other non-fatal means of self-defense to be legalized. However, tonight's debate is not about those weapons, nor is it about martial arts. All we're arguing is for a relaxation for the absolute ban on pepper spray. Saying that allowing pepper spray is necessarily opening the doors to other weapons is misleading at best. There's numerous jurisdictions where pepper spray is legal and other non-lethal methods of self-defense such as tasers are still outlawed. According to research on LegalBeagle.com, even in the USA, land of the Second Amendment, tasers are illegal in seven states where pepper spray is legal. Allowing pepper spray does not necessarily open the doors to other weapons and vice versa. Their second speaker stated that one might never use pepper spray and that it's too expensive. However, I remind you that our first speaker also said that the spray is an emergency weapon. No one goes around telling people not to put a defibrillator in their building just because it's expensive. Their second speaker also went on to argue that martial arts is a good alternative. Yes, it may be a good alternative. However, training in martial arts takes a long time to reach a good level of proficiency. We need something now. Turning now to a brief summary of our team's case. Our first speaker, Ethan, outlined the legal framework applicable to the possession of pepper spray in SA and our proposal that pepper spray should be allowed but strictly controlled. He also went on to discuss the fact that all citizens have the fundamental right to defend themselves. He highlighted the fact that potentially vulnerable people being able to carry pepper spray would level the playing field and he provided increasing worrying data on the rate of sexual assault in SA. Our second speaker, Zaza, contrasted the temporary effects of pepper spray with the long-lasting impact of assault, particularly the sexual assault. She also looked at the laws in force around Australia in relation to pepper spray. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, our team strongly believes that pepper spray should no longer be categorised as a dangerous article in South Australia and therefore prohibited in all circumstances. Instead, it should be permitted provided that key, certain key circumstances are complied with. Thank you.
I call upon the third negative speaker, Will Roke. Good evening, Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard, tonight's debate has discussed the topic that pepper spray should no longer in South Australia should no longer be a prohibited substance. We the negative team strongly disagree with this statement for the well-founded reasons that pep spray was originally prohibited. Um, pep spray is not the practical option for self-defence the opposition would have you believe. Rather, it is a weapon which is only effective in the hands of violent perpetrators, oh, sorry, in the hands of a trained individual who is prepared for the specific situation such as a violent perpetrator. These factors make pepper spray a justifiably prohibited substance, and it should remain so. Before I go on to summarise our 10 case, I'd firstly like to highlight some of the flaws and issues that we find in the opposition's case. Um, the first of which, which our first speaker has already mentioned, is our concern with the model that the opposition has proposed. Um, while much of this we see as satisfactory for this debate, they stated that uh, training should be a prerequisite for acquiring a licence. Um, and their second speaker went on to support this by saying that training would be ideal and it would be a good option. Um, while we agree that training would be ideal, it's not realistic in a licensing system. Um, it's simply not practical for many, many reasons. And many of the systems around the world for licensing are easily cheated, such as in America with their gun laws. Um, it's unrealistic to model this debate around a licensing system which would be perfect and have all individuals trained in pep spray use. As such, we see a much more reasonable model being similar to the US licensing system where applicants simply apply for their licence and provide um, reasonable docu documentation. Um, to go on to the first speaker's point, um, they stated that... Um, Pep spray is ideal for self-defence, um, and for that reason it should be unprohibited. However, um, they s stated that... Um, sorry. Um, however, pep spray, as our previous speakers have already shown, can be highly ineffective. It doesn't always work. Police officers have died relying on pep spray, why should we legalise this as a false sense of security for vulnerable people who could simply believe they can, they can be safe now and do whatever they like, when in actual fact this um, spray poses more of a risk to them? Um, further, they stated that um, they actually admitted that pep spray is not the most effective solution to self-defence. Um, and we 100% agree that pep spray is not the most effective um, solution. In fact, it's far from the most effective solution. Um, it's $3,000, as the first speaker stated. Um, this makes it inaccessible to most people. Um, much more accessible forms of self-defence could include whistles or safety buttons, or, as our second speaker has already stated, learning self-defence. Um, while this price that the first speaker stated proves, like, makes it unaccessible to um, those who could be victims and would use it. Um, this doesn't necessarily form a barrier to perhaps armed robbers, trained criminals who would want to acquire the substance to impose, um, to be a perpetrator and commit these crimes of armed robbery, assault, murder and so on. Um, further, he, the opposition second speaker stated that we have a right to self-defence um, and the right to carry a self-defence weapon. Um, while our research has shown that maybe there is a um, right to self-defence in legal systems where you can defend yourself with reasonable force, the opposition stated no sources which explicitly state that you have a right to a self-defence weapon. This is simply untrue. The opposition has lied in this statement. Um, further, uh, the opposition stated that uh, we require a means to self-defence, that we don't have a means to self-defence, therefore we should allow pep spray specifically. Um, however, as I've already stated, pep spray is not the best solution, and we 100% agree with this. We should allow means of self-defence 
which are more effective, make forms um, of self-defence such as martial arts more accessible, make um, safety whistles more accessible, and so on. The opposition's second speaker stated that Australia bans most weapons, um, and as such, um, allowing some of these weapons wouldn't lead to a dramatic increase in violence. Um, however, we'd like to compare this to America with much more lax um, bans on weapons, such as guns and pepper spray. They have an 88% higher um, incidence of violent crime, including armed robbery and assault, according to NationMaster. To summarise our team case, our first speaker spoke about the dangers to the public if pep spray were to be legalised in South Australia. His first point outlined the similarities between this case and the gun laws in America. A right to self-defence is not a right to weaponry, which can be very dangerous. Um, he then spoke about the necessity for training in order to keep this weapon non-lethal. He discussed the practicality of pep spray, impractical for self-defence, but when prepared, highly effective in assault. Our second speaker went on to elaborate on this point of practicality. Pep spray simply isn't a reliable means of self-defence. And this false sense of um, security can and has led to deaths, as was the tragic case with the police officer who was trained in use with this pep spray. To conclude, pep spray is quite literally a dangerous article. None of us disagree with that. It should remain that way as a dangerous article under Australian law and remain prohibited in South Australia. Thank you.